All right, well, thank you very much <clears throat> for the introduction. Uh, yes, I'm going to talk about Madame Blavatsky, who is uh, not quite a contemporary of Carlyle, but uh, sort of the next generation, uh, sort of the late Victorian uh, period. Um, and um, she's with us. <laughs> These are the astral bells uh, that were known to accompany the phenomena that uh, she could produce. And uh, apparently she could do it on command, and uh, she got in some trouble for it, and after a certain point she refused to do anything like that. Uh, I usually wait until the end of the talk to put in the plug for my book, but since um, it turns out that I usually don't get through all the material in my talk, I'm going to put the plug in uh, up front here. So uh, it's the book, Madame Blavatsky, The Mother of Modern Spirituality. Uh, why, do I, why do I have that subtitle? Uh, I think it's because if you're interested in Tibetan Buddhism, if you're interested in reincarnation, if you're interested in uh, sort of the roots of all the religions, if you're interested in ancient civilizations, if you're interested in all the kinds of things that we associate uh, sort of since the late 60s, early 70s with what we call the New Age and a variety of other sort of metaphysical spiritual pursuits, uh, you have Madame Blavatsky to thank for that. If we wanted to somehow extract her influence on modern spirituality, if you wanted to make it HPB free, her full name is Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, and she liked being known as HPB, uh, it would suddenly seem rather uh, anemic. A great many things would disappear. And it doesn't mean that everyone in this room or everybody out there who goes to a health food restaurant or meditates knows anything about Madame Blavatsky, but she basically was uh, the medium, as it were, uh, for these things to reach uh, the West and to become popular in the way that we understand them now. So, who was Madame Blavatsky? That's a very good question. Uh, I'm one of the many people who have attempted to, uh, if not answer that, at least to find out how difficult a question it is to answer. Uh, there are many biographies, many attempts to try to note the truth about Madame Blavatsky, uh, but as one of her um, more, let's say, generous uh, uh, investigators, a fellow named K. Paul Johnson, who wrote a book called The, the Masters Revealed, uh, said that Blavatsky is one of these people who goes out of her way to make things difficult for the biographer. Uh, this is something that's true of quite a few characters within what we might call the Western esoteric tradition. Uh, we can start with Plotinus, who was the Greek um, philosopher in the uh, circa 200 AD in Alexandria, who's uh, sort of headed a school of Neoplatonism, Neo the kind of mystical rereading of, of Plato. Um, he refused to have any portraits taken of him, uh, uh, painted, or, or obviously no photographs at the time, no selfies. Um, but uh, he said, my physical form is not my true you know, being. My, my true being is this uh, inner self that I'm trying to uh, reach and understand. And uh, we can take it up to more contemporary times in the form of uh, Carlos Castaneda, uh, <clears throat> who's, you know, uh, he was the author of many books of uh, faction, uh, based on the character Don Juan, the Yaqui uh, Indian who introduced him to the use of uh, uh, ceremonial practices uh, involving certain drugs. And Castaneda famously wouldn't have any photographs taken of him, and there's always shots with his hat in front of his head, and as if he's running, you know, just got arrested and doesn't want any photographs taken, and that kind of thing. So this is a tried and true kind of theme in the Western es esoteric tradition, is to somehow you cover your tracks. Uh, one of Blavatsky's um, followers, in the sense that came after uh, G.I. Gurdjieff, who was uh, another enigmatic character. Um, he too went out of his way to make things difficult. Um, but just to give you a quick run through of who she possibly be, or the many things that add up to being a Blavatsky, she was revolutionary, a spiritualist, a music teacher, cousin to her future, Russian prime minister, a circus horseback rider, a journalist, a Russian spy, possibly a prostitute, drug addict, but certainly the granddaughter of a princess among many other things. She's been described as an explosive madcap, one of the most accomplished and genius and interesting impostors in history, a cheeky creature, and electrically charged Leyden jar. So if you know anything about uh, electricity and science, you know what a Leyden jar is. If you touch it, boom, sparks go off. Um, she's been compared to an Irish peasant woman and has been called uh, the founding mother of the occult in America. So, not too bad. Right, so. Um, but what I'm going to say is that <clears throat> I think she also deserves a place among the makers of the modern world. Uh, 
Uh, I was going to put Darwin in there, but three is better than four, so he kind of predates Marx. He's one of the early, earlier makers of the modern world, with Karl Marx, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, who didn't care for Marx and is staring at him very, very nicely <laughs> there, and uh, Sigmund Freud, who figured them both out. But these are the ones, you know, we consider to be sort of makers of the modern world, they created the modern mindset, the world we all kind of take for granted. Um, but I would add one more figure there. I'd add Blavatsky. Now, you may ask, why am, why am I saying that? Uh, what uh, grounds do I have for this um, uh, assertion here that Blavatsky should share uh, the podium with uh, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud? Well, let's look at some of the people um, that she influenced. Uh, first one is Vasily Kandinsky. Uh, he's generally known as the founder of abstract art although, strangely enough, uh, a woman painter, Hilma F. Klint, a Swedish painter, may have predated him. She, too, was a student of Madame Blavatsky and also an offshoot of uh, theosophy, anthroposophy, uh, which was started by, from the uh, theosophist's point of view, the renegade theosophist Rudolf Steiner uh, in the early 20th century. Um, Kandinsky, as you say, he wrote a famous book, The Spiritual in Art, in which he foresaw a kind of coming new spiritual age uh, that was going to be somehow brought about by the discoveries of abstract art, which are informed by his theosophical studies. Um, Thomas Edison, who was uh, an enlightened one and an Illuminati of a different kind, uh, among the other things that he invented was, as we know, the electric lights that are, um, you know, helping us to keep things dim in this in this room here. Um, uh, he was an early member of the Theosophical Society. Uh, we'll get along to that. Uh, at the time that he joined, he was trying to invent a kind of recording device that would be able to record the spirit voices that were coming in um, seances and things of that sort. Uh, again, he was a very early member of the Theosophical Society. And we have W.B. Yeats over here, uh, winner of the Nobel Prize in, I think, 19, uh, for literature in 1923. Um, he was an early member of the Theosophical Society in Dublin, in Ireland, uh, when he came here to uh, London. Um, he met with Madame Batsy. I'll get on to telling a bit of that story uh, later on. Uh, but he was uh, very, very influenced by the theosophical ideas, and they uh, appear in quite a few of his poems. There's a few more. We got L. Frank Baum, uh, creator of Wizard of Oz. Uh, the Wizard of Oz books, we all know the movie, but the books, there's quite a few of them, and they're, they're, they're rich in theosophical ideas, ideas that he picked up through his early membership of the Theosophical Society. In the middle there is Alexander Scriabin, who was a Russian composer of the Fond de Siec of the 1890s. Um, he's known for works like the Poem of Ecstasy and the Poem of Fire. Uh, he was an ardent theosophist. He liked Kandinsky, but for music he believed that art was a way we can reach the higher worlds, the other planes, the spiritual dimensions. Uh, he envisioned a work that, sadly, uh, he left unfinished and was never performed. It was a huge mass. Uh, he had uh, wanted to be performed in the Himalayas, and it would be the end of a week-long sort of mystery experience, like the ancient uh, Greek mysteries of Eleusis uh, and Delphi and places of that sort. And along with uh, a, a huge choir and a huge uh, symphony orchestra, he also devised something called the color wheel. Uh, that would project colors, it was like an early light show, it would project colors that were associated with the music, and this was another theosophical idea, uh, what's called synesthesia, that there are certain colors and certain sounds that, that kind of go together, uh, and that they have a significant sort of spiritual uh, meaning. Um, this rather dour looking gentleman at the end there is T.S. Eliot, who uh, lampooned Madame Blavatsky in his famous uh, poem, The Wasteland. He calls her Madame Sosostris. She has a, a wicked pack of cards, uh, which is actually a low shot because uh, Blavatsky did not tell fortunes and she didn't use the tarot. Um, but in a way, uh, Eliot's kind of covering over his own tracks because while he didn't sit at Madame Blavatsky's feet, he did sit at the feet of uh, a fellow Russian, uh, the philosopher P.D. Uspensky, uh, who lived uh, in England, came here in 1921, and uh, he's most known as a follower of uh, G.I. Gorgiev, who I mentioned already, uh, but he wrote a, a book called Church and Morganum that became a surprise bestseller in England and America, and it's full of theosophical ideas. And um, in the, 1921, he was invited 
he was saved from a white Russian uh, emigre camp in uh, Constantinople, soon to be Istanbul, uh, by Lady Rothemir, who was the wife of the newspaper baron at the time, because she was a very devoted reader of Respensky's book, and she invited him to come to London. And in uh, St. John's Wood, uh, she had a salon much like that, uh, where, this one, where uh, Uspensky uh, gave a talk, and Eliot and um, Huxley and uh, Gerald Hurd and quite a few other people from the London literary scene at the time uh, were there. I mean, you can find a lot of theosophical ideas in Eliot's later poems, like the, the Four Quartets. This gentleman here is W.Y. Evans Wentz, uh, which is a great name. Uh, he put together and had translated the text that we know as the Tibetan Book of the Dead, thus inaugurating the fastest growing religion in the West. Um, Madame Blavatsky is responsible for that. If you, if people like Richard Gere and lots of Hollywood celebrities that are into Tibetan Buddhism, I don't know if they know about Madame Blavatsky, but they have her to thank for their interest in um, Tibetan Buddhism. A uh, gentleman in the middle is D.T. Suzuki, who introduced Zen Buddhism to the West uh, in the early 20th century. And uh, he was uh, later tangentially responsible for much of the Beat Generation uh, because people like Jack Kerouac, uh, Gary Snyder, um, Allen Ginsberg and others like that uh, were very taken with Zen Buddhism. Uh, they weren't that interested in Theravada, which is um, a bit dull. And um, <clears throat> the Mahayana hadn't quite uh, hit with them either. They liked Zen because it was kind of fast and quick and boom, man, wow, you know. So uh, if you know uh, Kerouac's novel, The Dharma Bums, uh, there's a great deal of Zen Buddhism in there. And um, taking up to contemporary times, uh, Tenzin Gyatso, the current uh, Dalai Lama, he spoke very highly of a book of Madame Blavatsky. It's called The Voice of the Silence, which is a short meditative text, which is rather different from <clears throat> these other huge tomes that she was responsible for, which we'll get around to. And even though Blavatsky's interpretation or... Uh, her kind of form of Tibetan Buddhism has been criticized by um, more academic, uh, stringent sort of students of it. Uh, it was sort of responsible for the whole kind of wave of Tibetan Buddhism starting. And uh, the Dalai Lama uh, acknowledged that in um, an introduction to uh, a later edition of The Voice of Silence. And just one more little group here to give you some idea who we're talking about. And we have here um, Annie Besant, uh, talking about a woman of power. Um, she had some and she wanted a lot. She got her holes on, got her hands on, a great deal of it. Um, Annie Besant, I know she was a suffragette, uh, the match girl um, strike. Um, she f fought for uh, birth control. Um, she uh, was, uh, had an affair with Bernard Shaw. Uh, she was jailed. You know, she was a martyr, uh, but um, when she was um, given one of Blavatsky's books, The Secret Doctrine, to review for uh, a journal called the Pall Mall Gazette, uh, 1891, when he came out, whose editor, by the way, was W.T. Steed, or Stead, and he was one of the fatalities on the Titanic. Interesting tang tangent there. Uh, she met Blavatsky and was converted on the spot. Uh, Blavatsky said to her, Oh, Miss Besant, if only you would come among us. And uh, she did. She melted right th then and there. Um, someone else who was highly, deeply influenced by Blavatsky was uh, Mohandas Gandhi. Uh, you often hear stuff about Blavatsky being responsible for a lot of kind of weird racism, kind of weird right-wing occult racism. She was supposed to have sort of introduced the ideas of uh, kind of occult racism to some early, well, they weren't Nazis at the time, but proto sort of Aryan. Uh, kind of thinkers. Um, I'm thinking of Guido von Liszt, if, if you know about him, uh, his school of Ariosophy in uh, Vienna in the early 20th century. Uh, but actually, uh, she had more influence on Gandhi than Hitler, uh, anybody else. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the story later on if I get to it. Uh, I'll tell you now. I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, um, what happened was that uh, Gandhi was in London and he was busy trying to be Ben Kingsley. You know, he was like <laughs> wearing bowler cap and suit and all that kind of thing. And he met these two, um, th th they're always depicted as brothers, but they actually were cousins. Um, um, young, young men who uh, were very interested in meeting a, a, a real full, you know, full-blooded Indian, as it were, because they were deeply interested in, in Indian religion and in Indian scriptures and uh, they spoke to him and they said, oh my god, wouldn't it be great for all three of us to try and read the Bhagavad Gita in the original language? 
and Gandhi had to very shamefacedly admit that he had never read it in any language. He, he, he was taught to ignore all that kind of stuff. The, the Christian missionaries I taught him told him it was all nonsense and superstition. And, you know, they uh, spoon-fed him um, Christianity and all that kind of thing. And he would, uh, they said, well, in that case, you have to come meet um, Madame Blavatsky. And so they pulled him over to, I think it's when she was living on Avenue Road over in, uh, it could be in Holland Park. She lived in Holland Park, she lived on Avenue Road over near Regent's Park as well. Uh, but they pulled her over to her place, and she had a talk uh, with him. And after that talk, he said the Bhagavad Gita became the most central book in his life. And his uh, doctrine of non-violent uh, non resistance uh, was based on the Bhagavad Gita and based on his talk with Madame Gavansky. Um And the fellow who followed on after Gandhi, uh, just to say, uh, even on his last day, Gandhi spoke well about theosophy throughout his entire life. And even on the last day when he was assassinated, uh, in his journal, he had written an article praising uh, theosophy. The fellow who took over when India actually got its independence uh, was Jawaharlal Nehru. Uh, he was initiated into, well, he, he wasn't really initiated, but he kind of joined you know, the Theosophical Society uh, uh, by Annie Besant. Uh, Annie Besant was around when Gandhi came and visited Madame Blavatsky um, uh, on that uh, occasion. So, so I think, you know, if you take a look at uh, these people, you might feel that there is good reason to uh, suspect that there are, you know, uh, some valid credentials behind the idea that Blavatsky um, is as important, let's say, just in terms of cultural influence and the effect she's had. I mean, these are only a few of the people. There's many, many others. And this is in the broader uh, kind of cultural world. I mean, she's had an enormous influence on the whole sort of spiritual, esoteric, other kind of world. But, you know, that doesn't count so much, but when you realize the amount of influence she's had on people that we all know. It seems to pack uh, a bigger punch. So, let's get some idea of uh, where she was from and what she was about. I was in search of the unknown, uh, and she found it. Um, she was born in 1831 in, um, it's called Dnepropetrovsk now, and it's in the Ukraine. At the time it was Ekaterinoslav, and it was in Russia. And we all know that Russia has some confusion over what's Ukraine and, and what's Russia. Uh, that was going on back then, and it's going on now. Um, her mother was the daughter of... Her mother's mother was the daughter of the princess. So she, she doesn't quite fall into the noble line herself, but her mother's grandmother, let's say, was the, the daughter of the princess. Um, her father was a German military man. Uh, Peter von Hahn. She was born Helena von Hahn. Her mother was a very famous and popular and well-respected novelist uh, at the time. This is the time, this is the eight, she's born in the 1830s. Um, her mother's writing after, her mother had her, I think, when she was 17. Uh, her mother was writing around this time. Uh, it's the time of people like Gogol. Uh, Pushkin is, not you know, a little, little bit earlier than that, Turgenev getting up to Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Uh, her mother was very, very highly respected as a writer. Valerian uh, Belinsky, who was one of the great uh, Russian literary critics at the time, spoke very highly of her. She was considered the Russian George Sand. Um, and she wrote a lot about the woman's plight um, and at, at the time. And she herself was not a particularly happy marriage. Uh, her husband was a hard-nosed practical man who didn't really think much about her literary pursuits and her poetry and dreams and all that, so it was kind of a, a mismatch. And a lot of that, a lot of that frustration, a lot of that longing went into her writing. And I think it, it trickled down, down into uh, Helena uh, herself, because uh, she wasn't going to be trapped in anything like that. And um, incidentally, uh, Lubetsky's sister uh, also became a writer of, of children's tales. And many of Blavatsky's critics said that she too became a writer of fiction uh, with all of these books about occult science and the occult history of mankind and, and so on and so on. Um, apparently, uh, again, around the time when she was born, this was the reign of Nicholas the, the I. He was a very repressive, uh, conservative Tsar. And he had uh, sort of stopped all the reforms that his predecessor, Alexander I, uh, who was much more sort of open-minded and was even sort of open to quite some, some esoteric things, as I hope we'll get on to. Uh, he, he had a clamp down 
One of the reasons was that the Freemasons were very much involved in what was known as the Decemberist Revolt, or the Decemberist Uprising, which happened in 1825. And they, they were put down very quickly, and Nicholas just imposed. Uh, there was, the order of the day was orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. And we can say that Blavatsky, when she came of age, turned that all around. And I think it was, uh, what did I write here? Subversion, uh, unorthodoxy, subversion, and cosmopolitanism, which is, in a way, is the polar opposite of the, the kind of order of the day in which she was born into. Because uh, as soon as she could, she hightailed it out of there. Um, and um, one of the things that set her on her path uh, in the journey of unknown was coming upon her great-grandfather Pavel Dolgorukov's occult library. Now Pavel was a Russian Freemason of the Rosicrucian sort of branch. Now, I can't go into too much detail about who the Rosicrucians were, or, or, or Freemasonry, or the, the very important uh, impact that Freemasonry had on Russian history at this time, um, and in, in the 19th century. Um, but um, what was in, involved uh, was that the, this Masonic group, this is the time of the real Illuminati. Not, not the people you'll come across on the internet, or Kanye West, or these kind of people like that. It's the real Illuminati. They existed very, very briefly. They were the brainchild, or brain dead child, actually, of a fellow named uh, Josef Weishaupt, who was a Bavarian uh, Mason, um, who actually, he, he, he was completely the opposite of what Freemason was about in many ways. He had no occult interests whatsoever. He did want to overthrow the monarchies of Europe. He basically wanted to go to the Habsburgs and all that kind of thing. And so he created this kind of subgroup the Illuminati, and he attracted quite a few people, some famous people, Goethe, people like that were interested in this kind of thing. Uh, but it never really got off the ground. And uh, the, when the Bavarian government heard about this sort of plan, they, they kind of squelched it uh, very early on. So that's about it. I think they were, they were out of business by 1785. They've been blamed for everything since then. Uh, but uh, that was like the extent of their, their real existence. But they had real political plans, and not only the Illuminati, but other Freemasons at the time had real sort of what we would consider progressive political plans, in the sense that they wanted to get rid of the monarchy, they wanted to go to the oppressive regimes that were in place at the time, they wanted to open things up to a more uh, liberal uh, view, and this is very much goes back to the earlier Rosicrucians who were in the early 17th century, the early 1600s. Um, again, you might just want to look them up. Again, there's somebody who really existed at some point, and then later on lots of groups took the name Rosicrucian, and they don't have anything to do with them really. But they were real factual people who existed at a time in the early 1600s. But in any case, Blavatsky came upon this wonderful occult library that her great-grandfather had. And in the midst of this, she says that she discovered these documents that talked about this plan that the hidden superiors had to change the map of Europe. Now, the hidden superiors are um, an aspect of this particular Freemason group that her great-grandfather belonged to. It was called Strict Observance. And hidden superiors were people you didn't know who they were. They wore masks, or you never heard from them. They were Mr. X, basically. But it was called Strict Observance because you had to observe whatever they said. You had to strictly, whatever commands they gave, you had to sort of do them. And uh, this was the more mystical sort of side of Freemasonry. It was uh, ceremonial magic, alchemy, and a variety of other what's you know, considered occult kind of pursuits and scientists were involved in this. So this really got her going when she came upon this. And it's been said that she had psychic experiences from her youth, and she always felt a kind of something was there, and you know, she didn't know quite what it was. And then when she came upon this library, she said, oh, this was it. And this sort of sent her on her road. Now, <clears throat> what happened... Um, is that, uh, well, two things happened at this point. Oh, I should, I should say that um, Lubetsky's mother died when she was 11, when she was, when she was quite young. Uh, and so this was something that was really important to her, an important effect on her as well. She was given to her maternal grandmother to, uh, you know, to, to bring her up. And that's how she came into contact with uh, her grandfather's uh, library. She meets someone called Prince Galitsyn, uh, who was a young man, a bit older than she was at the time, she was a teenager now, and he tells her of his own searches in the East and other places for secret knowledge, hidden wisdom, um, all this kind of thing. And he excites her, uh, talking, you know, by telling her all these stories about the people he's met, uh, these kind of seekers of truth, like, like himself, who journey in 
basically they network at the time before you have the internet and anything like that. Um, and um, Prince Galitzin's own great grandfather was a very important character in the Masonic circles at the time uh, when Blavatsky's great grandfather was there too. He was very important. He actually was very close to the Tsar Alexander I and um, gave him sort of spiritual literature to read. And there's, there's, there's stories that Tsar Alexander I faked his death and went off to a monastery. And apparently, during the early Bolshevik time, they uh, exhumed um, the corpse and the, the coffin was empty. So, don't know, but this is something that was there. But what happens is that she marries an older man, Nikifor Blavatsky, who is the uh, governor uh, of a place called Ur, 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 Urvan, or Urvion, sorry, my getting a little dyslexic um, here. And um, he's about twice her age, a little bit more than that. She's about 17. It's unsure why she marries him. Um, some people say it's because nobody else would have her. Uh, some people say it was on a bet. Some people say she, she thought in advance to marry this guy and actually ditch. You know, he, he was a way to get out of her family, to get out of where she was because she wanted to hit the road and journey for, you know, for the unknown. In any case, she marries him. And uh, the marriage remains unconsummated. Um, in fact, Vlasky remains celibate throughout her whole life. In fact, at one point, it proved that she was not the mother of an illegitimate child and also that she was, had not spent time in the flesh pots of Paris. And if you, get a, if you have any idea of Madame Vlasky's um, fulsomeness, uh, you might wonder if you know, she, anyone was, would have been interested in her in the flesh pots of Paris. Excuse me, I'm sort of making a sort of weightist statement there, I guess. But in uh, any case, she was accused of sort of having a loose, very loose life, and at one point she had a gynecological examination to prove that she was impossible for her either to have sex or to have children. And in her own very forthright, frank language, she said, uh, a cucumber is stuck up in there somehow. Um, so there you go. Um, so, but during this period, um, she hit the road, hightailed it out of uh, where she was in the Caucasus with her crestfallen husband, and uh, her booty heels wandered quite a bit. Uh, exactly what happened between her leaving her husband and turning up in 1873 in Battery Park in New York City is not quite absolutely certain. Uh, a lot has been said, where she went, what she did, who she met, uh, and a not a heck of a lot of it can be corroborated. Um, but she crossed the uh, American Middle West on a Conestogan wagon, she apparently visited the pyramids in Mexico, uh, the pyramids in Egypt as well, traveled through uh, Greece, most of Europe, a um, variety of places, but the most controversial place where she said to have traveled was in Tibet. Um, she said that she had journeyed in Tibet three times trying to get there. And finally she got there. And all told had spent seven years in Tibet. Now whether it's true or not, there isn't a knockdown, you know, knockout punch saying no, she couldn't have been there. But equally so, all the evidence that suggests she may have been is, 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 is purely circumstantial. So, um, if you want to know, you have to buy my book and read, and you can find out um, all the stuff in there about her. So, but it's been said that she, she spent uh, seven years in Tibet. Why did she go to Tibet? She was sent there by her masters. Uh, we have Master Kuthumi over there, and Master Moria over there. Now, again, exactly when she first heard of the masters, when she first met them or not, it's up for grabs, depending what time in her life Somebody asked her that question. Um, the central story is that in 1851, during the Great Exhibition here in London, the uh, Crystal Palace Exhibition, uh, she was there, she was traveling um, either with her great aunt, she was sort of her traveling companion, and while they were going through there, uh, Master Moria appeared. And she was struck because this, she remembered, was the vision of the holy man that she had had all through her childhood. Again, there's all these retroactive sort of stories about, yes, when I was a little girl, I had this vision, da 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 and all that. So, again, it's kind of like you have to put jigsaws together and make your own decision as to how much is true, how much is made up, who the masters really were. But that's sort of the, the central kind of story. So in 1851, she met one of the masters at the Great Exhibition in London. 
and he talked to her and he told her that she must come to Tibet. Because if she goes to Tibet, she will receive training in her psychic powers. She will receive training in, in the true spiritual philosophy, the true knowledge. And, this is, and it's her job, her task, to bring this knowledge to the West. So, what's the place most in need of spiritual teaching in 1873? I don't know if you're old enough to remember the song by, uh, uh, I think it was Jaden Americans in the 1960s, Only in America. Can a kid from anywhere get a job someplace and grow up a millionaire? And we, we, know, we know who they were talking about, um, you know, 50 years ahead uh, of time. Uh, but uh, this is a picture of Orchard Street, Lower East Side, New York, about 1891. It's about just short of 20 years after Blavatsky turned up, but it wasn't vastly different. And if you see her over here, she has the ubiquitous cigarette. Um, she smoked like a chimney, constantly. Uh, unlike many spiritual people today, she didn't give a hoot about her health or well-being or any of that kind of stuff. Her cholesterol levels were scandalous. Uh, one of her fa favorite dishes was two fried eggs and a bowl of uh, melted butter. Oh. Yes, and she smoked constantly. Um, she was um, teetotal was against drugs, although she was accused of uh, uh, smoking hashish. Uh, and, you know, I remember when I was first reading about this stuff, the idea of her constantly rolling joints and smoking, wow, it's cool, and all that kind of stuff. But uh, even back in the day, people weren't smoking back then, they were eating it uh, most of the time. Uh, and the, uh, the uh, accusations of her smoking hash came from people that were trying to uh, basically uh, undermine her character. Uh, she became public enemy number one among spiritualists. Um, in her career, uh, because she basically she said that the spirits that were arising at these seances weren't Uncle uh, Jack and Aunt Betty. They were the kind of astral hobos hanging around um, in the astral plane and nothing better to do, and we're happy to tell you whatever you want to hear. And um, she said all the spiritualists who were contacting somebody's you know dead aunt or grandmother, they you know they, not that they knew they were faking, but they weren't they weren't contacting who they thought they were contacting. And the spirituals at the time um, didn't care for that, and so they they. Uh, uh, you know, sort of definition of character uh, uh, campaign against her. Uh, but there she is, she arrives there in New York. Uh, the story about her getting there, uh, she was in Paris when she finally headed west. Uh, I, again, I'm leaving so much out about what, what she did. You know, she was, uh, she, she ran seances in Cairo. Uh, she headed a kind of uh, choir. I, I forget exactly which Eastern European country. She was said to be a circus bareback rider. Um, she fought on the barricades against the papal forces with Manzini, uh, with his uh, young Italy Risorgimento forces. Uh, she, she, she was uh, uh, an intense uh, anti-Catholic, and anti uh, and, and not so much anti-Christian, although she didn't really care for Christianity that much. But she still recognized one of the great religions. But she hated the Roman Church, and she hated the kind of power it had, and the sort of authority and the hierarchical structure. And she she was more of a free-thinking humanist than anything else. I mean, she's associated with the occult, and nobody wants to touch her. I'm sorry, I'm going off on tangent here. I'm surprised feminists have not got a hold of her already, because she's talking about women of power. I mean, she was one of the most powerful women in the 19th century. But nobody touches her because of the occult stigma. But she was more of a free-thinking humanist than an occultist. She's basically more about, you know, liberal ideas of free speech and free thought and not so much free love because she thought sex was beastly. But uh, she was not this kind of occult, theocratic, uh, totalitarian kind of, you know, hierarchical uh, character that is usually associated with sort of occult kind of politics. She was the opposite. She was like a very, very intense kind of um, liberal, I would say. Um, but, uh, yeah, she, the story with her arriving uh, in America was that she had a, a um, first-class ticket, but when she was at the dock, she saw this woman and her children, they, they were in, in distress, and she talked to them. And uh, they said that, well, their husband was supposed to turn up with the tickets, but he, he never showed, and they didn't know what to do, and they didn't, they, they, they didn't know what happened to him, anything like that, they had no money. So she cashed in her ticket and bought uh, four uh, steerage. And so she crossed the Atlantic at the bottom, you know, if you ever see those old movies, you know, where people across the Atlantic and they're all, they're all on the bottom of the boat somewhere, sleeping on top of each other, she was, you know, one, one of those folks. And when she turned up in Orchard Street, she lived at a women's uh, cooperative. She worked as a seamstress. 
She got along very well with the Jewish kind of tailors there and all that sort of thing. Because she's been accused of anti-Semitism at different times uh, with different people, and there's no evidence for it whatsoever. Um, so yeah, she turns up in America, and she basically becomes an American success story. This is a little ahead of the time, but what was really big at the time and had been in America since the 1860s was spiritualism. Uh, spirits are among us, seances and things of that sort. I quickly mentioned that Bugatsky had held seances in Cairo. Um, this is, she, she held seances in Cairo after she survived the wreck of the Eumonia, which is uh, the great naval you know, the shipping disaster that was nobody knows about because the Titanic has eclipsed it, but this was like the big ship that went down before the Titanic did. Apparently she swam to shore. So this was one tough cookie. Um, but. Sansa is a really hot thing, and one of the characters who she meets and sends her on her way is Colonel Henry Steele Alcott, and as we know, he was a hipster well in advance of his time. Now, Alcott is a very interesting character. Um, he was an agriculturalist, he was a journalist, he was also, he, he was a military uh, Civil War uh, hero, he was also one of the few people that was part of the commission to investigate the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, but he was also a deep in interest in spiritualism, what we know as psychic phenomena. He was, he was a healer himself. And um, he was writing a series of articles about a particular sort of haunting that was going on in Vermont in a place called Chittenden. And it was ongoing. Uh, these spirits kept appearing in this house week after week after week. And he was up there writing like weekly uh, reports for different newspapers. And Blavatsky, who had been sent by her masters to spread the word, she needed a good PR man. She needed somebody to sort of, you know, be out there, you know, helping her. So she focused on Alcott. And this is very much like later on, of, um, if you're aware of this, how Gurdjieff himself did this with this philosopher Uspensky who I mentioned earlier. Very similar kind of situation where he needed a good front person. So she goes out of her way to seduce Alcott. And she goes up to this house in Chittenden where the hauntings are going on. And she is, she's wearing what's, what was known at the time as the Garibaldi shirt. And this was a, a red, sort of, bright red sort of military tunic with these buttons down there. And it has kind of regalia on it. And this was like given to her after fighting on the barricades with Manzini uh, against the papal forces and all that. And she's smoking like a chimney. And she's all kind of done up and all that kind of thing. And uh, he immediately sort of sees her and sort of is kind of fixated by her. And what happens is that gradually the kind of spirits, the kind of phenomena that's taking place change. And it isn't sort of local North American Indians that are kind of turning up, or you know, local people from the town. Suddenly all these Russians turn up. All these Russian spirits kind of turn up. Kalmuks and uh, people from the Caucasus and from the Ukraine and this kind of thing. And it turns out that Blavatsky is making it happen. She's not just the medium. She's not there sort of as a way for the spirits to come. The medium is like, you know, you're the means by which the spirits communicate. They take you over. She's taking the spirits over. Talk about a woman of power. She was a woman of power. She absolutely convinced Alcott that she could make these things happen. She, well, this is what she had learned in her years in Tibet. She had learned to master the powers of the mind. And so, they become the chums. Great friends. Platonic relationship. They're together for about a decade. I have that line up there, glittering and badly wrapped parcel. Uh, this was how one of her biographers, Peter Washington, declared, uh, uh, described her. This is how she turned up. She, she was like, kind of like dressed like a Christmas tree. She always like, wore very flowing robes, lots of color, and lots of kind of stuff, and all this kind of thing. And you know, she was actually, you know, she was a, a woman of some size. I mean, I, I, I say in the book, I'm, I'm surprised there isn't a film made about her, but then in, in an age of sort of anorexic models, you're not going to have anybody wanting to play a 232 pound uh, leading lady. Um, but um, she, she, for the next 10 years, they're sort of inseparable. And the major thing they do, among many, many other things, is um, they start the Theosophical Society. Now, if you go over to like Gloucester Road over um, by Baker Street, there's, there's the offices there, the headquarters there of the um, Theosophical Society in London. They're, they're, they're still going. Um, this is the original Theosophical Society sort of logo, as it were. Uh, there is no religion higher than truth. And you can see there's a slot sticker in there. There's a sort of Star of David. 
there's an Egyptian Ankh, there's, uh, I think that's Om up at the top in, in Hindi, you've got the, the snake, the Ouroboric snake, which is a symbol of eternity, eating its own tail. Uh, it was basically, there's something for everybody there. It was a one-stop shop uh, for religion, spirituality, and um, let me just read here, excuse me for a second, I can just read what, this, this was a bit later, uh, but this was sort of the mission of the Theosophical Society, which was, it was formed in se September 13, 1875 in, on, uh, in Hell's Kitchen in New York, of all places. Um, and uh, one is to form the nucleus of a universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or order, of co or color, excuse me. Uh, the study of ancient and modern religions, philosophies, and sciences, and the demonstration of the importance of such study. Number three, the investigation of the unexplained laws of nature and the psychical powers latent in man. So, this was what the Theosophical Society was originally um, founded in order to do. Um, and out of the three things, the thing that Blavatsky worked the hardest to bring about was the first one. To form this kind of universal brotherhood, regardless of sex, creed, gender, you know, whatever you want to, identity politi politics, whatever you want to call it these days. And this comes out of her Masonic roots. Because this is part of the Masonic mission in, in, the, in the 1780s, 1790s, and all that, and the Rosicrucian mission back in the 1600s. It was somehow formed, you know, basically a brotherhood of man and, and you know, women, of course, and all that. But I mean, that, that's the main thing. Um, and that often gets obscured when people talk about her, because they also talk about, oh, she was a kind of fraud, a kind of you know, medium psychic fraud, and all this kind of weird stuff. That's what she worked at the most. And one of the, one of the um, results of that, that happened after her death was in 1893 at uh, the Chicago World's Fair there was the first world's congregation of religions where for the first time you had Catholics and Protestant and Russian Orthodox and Jews and Hindus and Buddhists and Baha'i and you know quite a few others meeting together and talking about and trying to have the kind of multi-faith consensus that something that we all you know most of us sort of think is a good idea these days so what we, what we have here is got a stamp in India that shows how important Theosophical Society was. I'll get on to that a little bit further. Uh, back down there at the bottom, this is where the current Theosophical Society is in West 72nd Street, New York. It's, I'm sorry, it's a bit squished, but you can see the kind of lectures they had or a place in the world, life, karma, um, researchers and occultism. That's a postcard from the um, Indian headquarters of um, Theosophical Society in Adyar, uh, where we'll get to in a few minutes. But up top there, that's a postcard from uh, Point Loma um, Theosophical Society in San Diego. This, this was started by a, a woman named Kathleen Tingley. And among many other things, one of the things that Theosophical Society and Theosophy in general is responsible for is for introducing the avocado into the, ag the California agricultural system. Um, if you like your um, avocado toast these days, you have Madame Blavatsky to thank <laughs> for that. Um, after founding the Theosophical Society, she realized the society needed its Bible, and so she sat down and wrote this immense text called Isis Unveiled. Uh, if you know your um, ancient mythology, the whole idea of the veiled figure of Isis, uh, you know, no man shall rent her veil and all that, because you can't, you know, we can't see the truth, we're not sort of, we're not sort of up for the job and all that, but you know, she was ready to give the truth, and give the truth out. And basically, what she does in Isis Unveiled is show that the magic of the ancients is the science of tomorrow. And we're kind of still working on that today, right? With sort of Graham Hancock and all that kind of stuff still going on. But she was one of the first ones who put it all together. It's an incredible compendium. Uh, and she wrote a lot of it in this place here. I'm sorry it's not a, a better shot, but this was, this was her and Alcott's flat in New York. In, in Hell's Kitchen, it was called the Lamasery because it was done up. You think this place is, you know, over decorated? Um, <laughs> you should check it out. I mean, they did not go to IKEA for their stuff there. It was just completely. It had, you know, a variety of different exotic, Eastern mostly, uh, or Egyptian as well, um, kind of motifs and themes. So one of the one of the things in there, um, and there's a book named after this, is that they had a, a they had a, a stuffed baboon. Uh, that they had dressed in a tux, or it was kind of, kind of it was supposed to have like having a, a lectern in front of it and, and like a book and it was giving a, a lecture and it was supposed to be like T.H. Huxley 
or something like that. And she was she was a big one of the things along with repackaging and representing to the modern reader. It, it sold out overnight. It was an incredible bestseller. Uh, the Magic Lore of the Ancients it was that. Levatsky presented the first philosophical and scientific criticism of Darwin. There were plenty of religious criticisms. The gentleman who is most often given the credit for this is Samuel Butler, uh, who wrote The Way of All Flesh and Erewhon. Uh, in seven, 1878, he started publishing a series of books where he was criticizing Darwin. He said Darwin had banished mind from the universe. And people like Bernard Shaw, in, in his plays, uh, took up uh, Butler's sort of um, torch and ran with it. But Levatsky was ahead. Uh, Isis and Bell was published in 1877. And she basically says Darwin's right up to a point, but evolution doesn't stop there. In fact, everything, the entire universe, is, every little bit in the entire universe is going through this ongoing kind of evolution. So the evolution from monkey to man is only one bit, and from man to the gods is the next, and she's the one who's going to be uh, showing us the way to that. Um, and there's the announcement. Um, J.W. Bolton was the publisher. He didn't expect it to be the hit that it was, but it sold out in the first week, its first printing, and continued and continued and continued. It's still in print today. Uh, a Master Key to the Mysteries of Ancient Modern Science and Theology. And this is basically one of the kinds of um, ancient, mystical, magical kind of symbols that she's working with. We have the face, the face of God, the face of the divine on the waters, and you have the Star of Solomon, and uh, again, you have the Ouroboric, uh, I guess this is the Great Seal of, uh, I can't really read it there, in any case. It's, it's a very potent, magical, uh, sign. Okay, so what happened? Well, for some reason, very shortly after getting her American citizenship, Levatsky and Alcott decide to pull up stakes and go to India. A few reasons why that may have happened. Uh, one was sh she was getting some bad press. Uh, another was that she had got um, in contact with uh, a group in India that had um, heard about her, and they thought that her work in the Theosophical Society and their own work, they, they too were trying to uh, revive interest in the ancient religions, the ancient um, um, teachings and all that, and they thought perhaps the two can combine uh, forces. We don't quite know exactly why, but in 1878, five years after coming to the States, and again, only a couple months after getting her American citizenship, um, so for most of her travels after this, she was an American citizen, um, they decide to go to India. And um, they have fantastic success. Vasky and Alcott are the first two Europeans to convert to Buddhism. At least that's, that's, that's what's said. Now, Alcott became incredibly influential in Buddhism in Sri Lanka. It was Ceylon at the time. He basically, re basically taught the Buddhist Buddhism. They, they didn't know, much like Gandhi didn't know about it, uh, didn't know about Hinduism. He, he sort of renewed the people of Ceylon, Sri Lanka, their understanding of their own roots and all that. And he's, he's like a national hero there. There's a stamp, I think there's a couple train stations, there's some streets, there's a coin, um, all that kind of thing. So people would sort of take Alcott as kind of, you know, um, Sap, who was, you know, kind of like a Homer Simpson character, who was kind of like, you know, just sort of, you know, had the... Uh, wool pulled over his eyes by Levatsky. He, he, was, he, was, he was a pretty smart cookie himself, so I, I don't think he's quite the fool that many people uh, put him out to be. But what happens when they get to India, they're very successful, and they have two really important converts. One is A.P. Sinnott over here, who was the editor of the Allahabad Pioneer, which was the biggest uh, newspaper in India at the time. One of its um, uh, writers was Kipling. And another figure over here is A.O. Whom, who later became very much involved in the Indian independence movement. And he was one of the strong uh, people uh, promoting the Indian National Congress. And I have up here teacups and teleportation. Because this is when the kind of phenomena that Blavatsky was um, known for start to really happen, get, get going. She was doing things in New York. She was doing things in New York. Uh, but it's in India where it really gets going. I'm, I'm told I have five minutes left, so I don't know if I'm going to get through this whole thing again. See, this always happens. Um, but there's a famous story when she's having a picnic, or she's invited to a picnic uh, in a place called Simla. And the story goes is that they didn't bring enough teacups. They're going to have tea out in the jungle. And uh, just sort of nonchalantly, um, Sinnott's wife says, oh, well, 
Madam Blavatsky, what will you, will you, you know, will you indulge us in, you know, we're missing a teacup, can you, can you get one? She does it. And uh, she, she makes one appear. They go digging somewhere under the ground. It's pretty deep. And the ground, it's not broken over. It's solid. It, it doesn't look like it's been dug. And the roots aren't ripped up. But underneath, under the roots of a tree, so if you think in tree roots, is a teacup. <laughs> That's the story. And she was known to materialize lots of different things. Roses fell in the ceiling. Cigarettes appeared. Again, she smoked a lot, so she probably needed them. Um, cigarette papers, things of that sort. Um, and they spread the word. They're completely convinced by this. Uh, Sinnott writes a book called Esoteric Buddhism. And that's how people like Rudolf Steiner, W.B. Yeats, and other people first hear about Blavatsky. And um, always in pause. Other things that materialized were known in the Hatma letters. These were letters written to Blavatsky by the, the masters. And they too would just appear out of the ceiling. They would fall. And they'd be there. And after a while, not only Blavatsky was receiving these, but AP Sinnott. And you can go to the British Library, and there's a collection of them there, the actual letters. You can see them. Some are written in blue pencil, and some are written in red pencil. And they're very eloquent, very articulate, very well written sort of epistles, letters, about the theosophical life. And they're very different in the way Blavatsky writes. So again, just by textual kind of evidence, they don't... She has her own particular style. It's a hectoring, haranguing, very loud style. It bangs you over the head and stuff. These are very soft, eloquent, um, you know, rather, rather um, I mean, sober kinds of letters. You can check them out there. And, but this is the beginning of the downfall, as it were, or the, the big bump in the road. What happens is that during um, a visit here in London, Vatsky meets some of the people from the newly formed Society for Psychical Research, which is still going. I think it's over in Queens, uh, over, over by uh, the Science Museum, over that neck of the woods, uh, over there. And um, they talked to her and they said, we very much would like to investigate you. Um, and she said, well, I can't do it now, I'm sort of busy, but you could come to India, I'll be happy, you know, to show you, sh show, show you what's up. And so they send this fellow named Richard Hodgson. And Hodgson starts to see, he's, he's, he's kind of new to the job. And one of the things that Society of Psycho Research felt they had to do, they had to be even more skeptical than the skeptics. Because they were trying to prove this stuff was real, so they had to make sure there were no way they were getting the wool pulled over their eyes, no way they were getting the weight. No, they were getting fooled. So they kind of started out thinking, you're going to try to fool me in the first place. Right? Um, and so they send Hodgson over there. And at the same time as he goes over to investigate, uh, there's a, a snake in the grass um, raises its head. And this is in the form of an old friend of Madame Levatsky named Emma Cologne. And she was uh, one of her uh, friends in Cairo. <clears throat> when, uh, after surviving the wreck of the pneumonia, she was there, you know, running uh, seances. And she had sent Blavatsky, she had heard Blavatsky was in, you know, she read the newspapers. Blavatsky's known the world over by now. All, all the stuff is in all the newspapers. After Sinnott wrote about it in the, uh, the Pioneer, it got picked up by all the syndicated things, and it's all, it's worldwide, so it's kind of trending. It's, it's tweet, there's lots of tweets about it. And um, so she hears about Blavatsky, you know, basically doing well, and so she writes her a hard luck story, saying she's down and out, and anything you can do for us. And Vesky had a heart of gold, enormously generous person, not particularly a uh, good judge of character. Uh, but Russians are like that. They love everybody. And so she invites her to come over. And so she does. So Emma and her husband show up in, in Adyar, in India. And one thing leads to another, and they tend to feel like they're being slighted they tend to feel like they're not getting the kind of attention that they should get or something like that. And so, um, long story short, they wind up going to um, a Christian missionary newspaper at the time with the story that is an expose of Blavatsky. It's all fake. There's no materialization. But the letters have slipped through cracks in the ceiling. When you see the masters walking around, it's basically Blavatsky. She's got a big head on her shoulders and she's kind of going around. And, ooh, ooh, ooh. and everyone's just getting taken in by this kind of thing. And Hodgson, who's like ready to make his name at the Society of Cycle Research, uh, he listens to them, 
uh, Levatsky's not there at the time when, when, when he's there investigating. So he's not actually investigating her. He's investigating the milieu around her. I can't go into the details again, it's a plug to buy the book, but in the end he decides, as I said in the beginning, that she's one of the greatest imposters of all time, and she's most likely a Russian spy. And this, because this was the time of the great game. This was the time of Kim. You know, um, this was the time of uh, struggle for influence between Russia and, and Great Britain, in, in India, and in Tibet, and all those kinds of places. So it stands to reason that she's really a Russian spy, and he, he admires her chutzpah, but uh, he basically, and the things that she's most enraged at is not that he considers her a fraud, because people have heard that before, but that she, he thinks she's a spy. So she decides she wants to basically take this to court, but the others in the Theosophical Society are a little, they say, well, actually, <laughs> it's not a good idea. What's going to happen is that you're going to have to prove that you can produce phenomena in court. Are you going to do that? Are you going like, to you gonna make a teacup materialize in court? I mean, come on, you know, we, we believe in you, but really, is that going to happen? Long story short, they convince her to step down and to leave. So in order to keep the Theosophical Society going, to keep its reputation going, she takes the blame. This is something that, this is, again, this is part of the, there's a Russian spiritual way that's called the way of blame. And she takes it on, and she leaves, and she hits the road again. Strangely enough, I should say, many years later, the Society for Psycho Research actually retracted Hodgson's examination. They looked over it again, they said it was flawed, um, it, it had many, many mistakes in it. And so it's not exactly saying that sh she's not a fraud, that he didn't really expose her. But in any case, she hits the road. Um, this is somewhere, I think, in London, where she's working on the secret doctrine. She's enormous at the t by this time. She can barely walk. She's, I'll show you a picture of her in a moment. When she left India to come to Europe, she had to be hoisted on the boat. Like, you know, cargo. Uh, she couldn't go up the gangplank. She was too heavy, too big. Um, not, it wasn't only from her diet. She was, she was affected with what's known as dropsy. Uh, I forget what it's called now, the contemporary. It's basically your body retains water. And she, she would have, like, her flesh was folded over in places like that. And so, you know, she, it's like she, in any case, you get the idea. Um, so, she, again, she's hitting the road. She's in Germany. She's in Italy. She's in Switzerland. Writing, 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 writing. She told Yates, I write, 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 like the wandering Jew walk, walks, walks. Um, she wrote and wrote and wrote. The Secret Doctrine. And this is the book that kind of established her later on now is kind of, the, it's, it, it, it sort of overshadows Ice and the Veil, which I think is a better book just in terms of readability. The Secret Doctrine is this occult history of the cosmos, of humanity, of the Earth. And, and it's, it, you, you can't kind of, you can't do a precis of it. It's just, I mean, the main thing is that, you know, the Earth is part of this ongoing cosmic evolution. And there have been many, 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 many other races living on the planet before us. The universe itself has gone through many, many different incarnations. Um, she talks about the sort of Hindu idea of the sort of manvantara and the pra praladya, which is sort of these periods of activity and periods of sleep and all that. There's just a ton of stuff there. And this is something she wrote and wrote and wrote, and she felt she had to get this out, you know, uh, before uh, the end. And um, it's a book that Annie Besant uh, was asked to review and became um, what triggered her, her conversion. So here, she is in London, she winds up in London, I think about 1888. Uh, she was in Norwood for a while, uh, she was over in on Holland Park, um, but she's getting around in what was called a perambulator, uh, a pram, basically. She couldn't walk, she was pushed around. Um, this, this, this gentleman is G.R.S. G. R. S. Mead, I forget the other gentleman's name. Uh, Mead uh, was a Gnostic Theosophical Hermetic Scholar in his own right. Uh, he um, started the Quest Society, and uh, he's very well known for many, many translations of, of ancient sort of uh, spiritual and philosophical texts. Uh, but she was getting around in that. Uh, the last time she actually went to Europe and actually traveled uh, was to see the Eiffel Tower, and it just uh, been put up. So this is the context. So she's, she comes to London, it's kind of, this is London of the beginning of Sherlock Holmes, it's, it's a London of Jack the Ripper, and in fact she was even accused by Alistair Crowley of being Jack the Ripper. 
uh, he never had a good word um, for most of this competition uh, anyway. And uh, again, some of her visitors. Uh, young W.B. Yeats, he came. Uh, he's the one who said uh, he, she reminded him of an old Irish peasant woman. Uh, he thought she had a remarkable sense of humor. And there's a strange thing when he showed up, her cuckoo clock so it suddenly went haywire, sort of cuckooing. And she came out and she said, don't break my cuckoo clock, or something like that. Uh, and uh, she, she, paid, she played uh, what was known as patience. She's here. This always precipitated uh, materialization, so watch your heads, folks. Uh, the astral bells went off. Uh, she played patience, which is known as solitaire. This is a kind of a way, I think, that she put herself in a kind of trance. She played patience all the time, uh, this kind of thing. She was always sort of doing something to kind of... I, I didn't go into it, but there's good reason to suspect she somehow had a controlled multiple personality, a controlled dual personality. What I didn't say about when she was writing her books was that she would often like gaze out into the middle distance and write. And these were quotations from books she didn't have on reference. And then she would send people out to go check and they were mostly spot on most of the time. Alcott said when they were, she was writing Isis Unveiled uh, in the Lamasary that her face changed. She took on a completely different kind of physiognomy at different times. Her hair changed and all these kinds of things. So again, you know, check it out for yourself whether you, you, know, you believe it or not. But these are all these kinds of stories. I'm, I'm, I'm telling a tiny fraction of uh, most of the stuff. Um, in the middle was Annie Besson. As I said, she, she was asked to review The Secret Doctrine by W.T. Steed of the Pall Mall Gazette. Uh, she was completely taken over by Madame Lanazzi when she went there. She had to publicly recant her uh, statements about birth control and contraception in order to officially join the Theosophical Society because they were against contraception. Because all souls, as Monty Python uh, told us a long time ago, are special or whatever it is in that you know, the cheap shot they have in the film. Um, and um, other things of that sort. You know, so, and there's the young Mohandas Gandhi doing his best, as I said, to be Ben Kingsley. Mm -hmm. um, it's a story I, was, I told earlier when he um, met these two theosophists and they introduced her, uh, him, him to her. Um, so I think that gives you some idea who she is. Strangely enough, Vasky died on 8th of May, 1891. That's uh, five days from now. It's known as White Lotus Day now. And uh, theosophists around the world uh, celebrate that day in remembrance of her. Uh, she had to pull up stakes once again went into the Akasha, and, um, well, I don't know where she is right now, but I'm sure it's someplace very interesting. Thank you very much.